Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our latest uh, installment of our Distinguished Speaker Series. I am more than pleased to welcome the Honorable Andrew or Andy Weber to uh, as our next guest. Andy currently serves as a senior fellow at the Council on Strategic Risk and as a member of the Arms Control Association Board of Directors. Andy has spent his entire professional life in positions of great responsibility in the US government, often behind the scenes, uh, and as a true specialist and a true frontline actor in some of the most important and dangerous national security challenges our country has faced and continues to face. Uh, but his career spanned over 30 years. As Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs in the Obama administration, Andy was in charge of defending against the most severe threats we face we faced as a nation. He's an extraordinary public servant, and we're lucky to have him here today. On a personal note, before we begin, I just want to say it's somewhat of a surreal experience getting to interview uh, Andy, because I've known Andy since childhood, as he's a good friend of my brothers and our families, and, um, and uh, we're so proud of what he's accomplished in his professional career. But that's not why Andy is here. We're, we, the COVID-19 catastrophe, on top of many of the other proliferating security issues are dangerous and in many ways have gotten worse. So there's no better time to hear from an expert like Andy than now. So Andy, welcome to our DSS series. Thank you, Jim. Um, I wanna just start before we get into the meat of it, I, I wanna remind our audience that we'll go for about 40 or 45 minutes and then we're gonna open up your questions. So please keep putting them in the chat. Um, but let me let me uh, start before we get into the to the meat of it and just ask you, how did you uh, get to the field of government service and particularly to the realm of national security? Um, you know, was this always your ambition growing up? Um, no, not at all. But I was always interested in foreign affairs. Uh, I did read the New York Times as a kid. Uh, we had, had it delivered to the house every day. And uh, um, when I finished um, uh, college, I, I took the foreign service exam, and then I ended up getting a, a master's degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And at that time, I wanted to either be a, a foreign correspondent or a foreign service officer. And I passed the exam. And the next thing I, I knew, I went into training and they sent me overseas. And when you went overseas, you found yourself in probably one of the most interesting areas, right? And so, you know, it's interesting that when I, the older I get, our, the average age of Bridgewater is probably in the late 20s or something. So maybe you could walk us back to the early 1990s. This is the time of the disintegration of the former Soviet Union. You're, you're fresh, you know, fresh into your career. What's going on? Set us, set us, set us the context, if you would. Well, I started my career in the Middle East, and actually I was in Saudi Arabia uh, during the, the first Gulf War, which was uh, just at that time, uh, in 1991. And then the Soviet Union, which had been our adversary um, for decades, ever since World War II ended, um, started cracking up. And things changed. We, we went from worrying about the strength of the Soviet Union and a potential military conflict to the weakness of the Soviet Union. As all these uh, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons facilities throughout the Soviet Union um, were at risk uh, of loss of control of loose nuclear weapons and materials and scientists. So at that time, uh, two visionary senators Sam Nunn from Georgia and, and the late uh, Richard Luger from Indiana passed legislation that created the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which was designed to have us help Russia and the other newly independent states get better control of these weapons and materials and destroy a lot of them. So you, you decide to go to Kazakhstan um, or at least into that region and one of the uh, events that probably you're best known for, although there's been many, is the thing called Project Sapphire. And, and everyone was uh, sent the podcast uh, you did uh, on this, but I'd like you, if you would, just to walk through 
the story of Project Sapphire and specifically, I mean, I, I still am a gape when, when I hear that, you know, your, your driver is, is, is driving you somewhere and he's, he asks you, hey, Andy, do you want to, or Mr. Weber, do you want to buy some uranium? So walk us through that story and what this, you know, what this whole mission was about. And while you do that, I'm going to also, from time to time, bring up some pictures so that people can see what this was. So, so go ahead and tell us about Project Sapphire. Sure. Well, let me just say a couple of words how I ended up in Kazakhstan. Uh, I had been serving in the Middle East, as I mentioned, uh, also did some work against Libya's chemical weapons program. But I, I was uh, flying back from Frankfurt to Washington, D.C., and I read an article in February of 1992 about the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Almaty, Kazakhstan, which is the old capital. And the headline of that article was, uh, American Embassy Almaty for diplomats who find Paris a bore. And it was all about this country that had inherited nuclear weapons on its territory. And it sounded like a very exciting place to serve. So the next day I volunteered um, to go there. Uh, they checked. They were happy I had a pulse. And <laughs> they, you know, we had just opened 14 new embassies in these, in these uh, former Soviet republics that had become countries. And I spent a year in Russian language training, uh, arrived in, in 1993 in the summer. And not long after I arrived, my, my automobile mechanic, uh, Slava, uh, asked me if I would be interested in buying some uranium. I mean, what was your initial reaction when he asked you that? Well, I, I had studied the facilities in the country, um, and there were at the time uh, a few incidents of nuclear smuggling occurring. We knew that the Iranians were interested in acquiring weapons of mass destruction and, and related materials and expertise, North Korea also. So I didn't dismiss it out of hand. Uh, I said, well, I'd like to learn more about it. And I'm certainly interested. It was very uh, vague at the time. And it actually took several months uh, uh, a moose hunting trip in the Altai Mountains with the factory director uh, where the uranium was allegedly stored. Um, before, um, we, you know, there were a lot of scams going on at the time too. So it took a lot of time to develop the information and uh, convince Washington that this was not some uh, scam. And so when, when the, you know, your, your Washington office is essentially saying, okay, it's not a scam. So what comes next after that? Well, we had a meeting, uh, President Nazarbayev, the first president of Kazakhstan, traveled uh, to meet with uh, Bill Clinton, uh, President Clinton in Washington. And we had uh, across the street from the White House, uh, where he was staying at Blair House, we had a... Uh, a secret meeting that wasn't on the public schedule. And we discussed uh, the situation uh, as we understood it and asked if, if we could send a, a small team to verify the presence of this uh, highly enriched uranium. And so uh, in March of 1994, I went together with an expert from our uh, national laboratories, from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, on a secret visit to the facility. And that's where I reported back to Washington that indeed they had approximately 600 kilograms of 90% enriched uh, you know, weapons usable uranium, and it was protected by a, a good padlock. A padlock. Well, that's, uh, that's, that, that makes all of us feel better. Now, I, I'm not an expert on you, on you, you, you know, enriched uranium, and I don't think many of the people listening here are. What does 600 kilogram, kilograms of enriched uranium actually mean? Like, how dangerous is that? Oh, it's enough to make um, several dozen nuclear weapons. So this is a big deal, and it's it's all secured by a padlock, right? So what comes next? What and and how are you know how you're leading this operation? How did how, walk us through this? This is like uh, the stuff of of thrillers in a sense. Well, it, it started out a little dicey, as sort of almost like a black market flavor to it. But we then brought 
President Nazarbayev into it and, and turned it into a secret government to government operation. And our Pentagon and Department of Energy, Department of State became directly involved. We had negotiations for the terms, um, how much we would be uh, compensating Kazakhstan for the materials, joint planning on security. And it was a, it was a long process. It was a logistical uh, nightmare to, uh, to package and, and move this much material. Of course, you can't pack it all together or it reaches a, a critical mass and can be very dangerous. So um, over a period of many months, we, we, we planned uh, for this operation. And then in October, uh, early October of 1994, U.S. military uh, cargo planes, C-5 Galaxy cargo planes, flew the team and all their packaging materials and equipment in uh, uh, really halfway around the planet. It was the longest uh, military cargo flight at that time in history. And uh, I was on the, on the tarmac uh, waiting for the, uh, the Air Force to land. In fact, um, I was in the control tower because nobody in the control tower at this remote uh, airfield in a town called Uskamenogorsk uh, spoke English. So they, they uh, and my Russian was pretty good by then. So they told me what to tell the pilot and, and I uh, facilitated communication. And when the, this enormous plane landed at this little airport, uh, I went out on the tarmac to, to greet them. And that's you right there. That, that, that's the, the little figure there in the, in the black there is you. And then this, this over here on the left, that is actually uranium right there. Is that right? Yeah, those metal rods are 90% enriched uranium-235. So that is directly bomb usable material in that bucket. And before we get into the operation to extract it and some of the details around that, were you aware at the time that any, any of the bad guys in a sense were trying to get their hands on these exact rods? We were, and, and, and that's why we operated under uh, just intensive secrecy because we thought the once it word got out that these materials were there, that they were going to be packed up and mobile on trucks, uh, you know, that's when they would be most vulnerable. So we managed it was sort of a miracle um, for Washington. Um, probably couldn't do it today, mm -hmm. but we managed to keep the entire operation secret right up until uh, the planes took off for the United States with the uranium just before Thanksgiving in November. Um, and then once the operation was completed, we had joint press conferences in Washington and Almaty announcing it. And that must have been quite, I mean, that could have been a career right there, but it, was, it wasn't the, um, and by the way, before we, we move on to some of the other operations here, there was a story about how when you, the trucks are moving through, it was an extremely uh, adverse weather, right? And that there was a lot of ice on the ground. Explain that. Yeah, so the, the packaging operations took longer than anticipated. And we were in a race against winter, which starts early. And it's just over the border from Siberia in northeastern Kazakhstan. Uh, so we packaged... Uh, the uranium onto trucks and about uh, three 30 in the morning, uh, we didn't even tell the American team. It was just me and the, the uh, Kazakhstan uh, KNB, formerly KGB Colonel, who was um, in charge of security for the operation. We um, uh, led a convoy uh, from the factory uh, to the airport and it was very bad conditions on the roads. There was black ice. These trucks loaded up with highly enriched uranium. Big old Soviet era trucks were sliding on the ice. And uh, I, I sort of thought to myself, I hope one of them doesn't slide off a bridge into the, into the river and I'll have to report to Washington that it's floating down the river. Uh, but luckily, you know, they know how to handle um, tough road uh, conditions in that part of the world and we made it to the airport. And then several hours later, the US aircraft arrived to take the material and the, uh, and the packaging team back to the United States. 
They did it um, with four aerial refuelings en route. They couldn't land anywhere. Um, and then they landed in, in uh, Dover Air Force Base. They were met by a secure transport uh, that took the material to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It's an amazing story. And by the way, there's going to be, as I understand it, a movie, a Hollywood movie made about this whole story. Um, and there's so much more. We could spend the whole time on that. Uh, there was also uh, activities around extraction, uh, extraction of anthrax, uh, you know, and also uh, the securing of bombers that could just deliver nuclear uh, weapons in Moldova and so on. But I want to actually, just for time purposes, move on here to this is really a period where there's cooperation that you're securing between um, the leaders of these states, as you mentioned. And you know, you're in a position, I, in 2009, President Obama talks about nuclear terrorism as probably the single greatest threat, and you're now the Assistant Secretary. Lots of money has been spent in this, and, and we, we look, at least as it pertains to Russia today, and um, I'm wondering what you make of where we are. It seems like we've gone backwards, you know, where there's more money going into nuclear weapons and other types of dangerous weapons, hypersonic weapons. Where are we and how do we get there? What, what failed along that path? Well, first of all, the, the uh, prevention programs that, that I uh, work the bulk of my career on, you don't get credit for the catastrophe that, that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure that the situation could have been much, much worse had we not had that cooperation. Um, and for example, uh, nuclear terrorism uh, was a concern. But when we started with Project Sapphire, about 50 countries had uh, enough uh, weapons usable uh, nuclear materials for a bomb. That number over several decades of hard work, difficult work, was reduced to less than 20. So at least with nuclear weapons, we, we could attack the supply, improve security at sites, and, and reduce that threat. But um, the situation with Russia is different. In, in, in the 90s, it was wild and open. The government in Moscow was very weak. Uh, the security services were, were not very effective. And we had pretty good access to these remote and secure facilities around the country. Unfortunately, that also meant that the bad guys had access to these facilities, but now it's a different situation. Um, you know, Putin has been um, an authoritarian leader in place now for a couple of decades and the security services are, are really controlling the country. Um, and of course our relationship has soured uh, since those uh, early days of, of Yeltsin in the 1990s. But we have to still deal with Russia. Uh, they have an enormous um, um, arsenal of nuclear weapons uh, aimed at the United States. And so we have to deal with them. We, we uh, just renewed a very important um, bilateral arms control agreement, the New START Treaty, uh, which was set to expire on the 5th of February of this year. And Presidents uh, Biden and Putin have extended it for another five years. And that's my, that was going to lead to my next question, which is that um, under this new administration, do you see, do you see, a, 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 and, and of course, Putin, do you see a viable path for better relations and cooperations on these catastrophic weapons or, or, or not? Well, I do, um, especially on, on nuclear weapons. I think we we can uh, now, now that we've extended the, the New START Treaty, we bought ourselves five years, we can have uh, uh, productive negotiations to uh, further reduce our um, nuclear weapons stockpiles and uh, enhance Russian security and American security. In the darkest days of the Cold War, we had those types of nuclear arms control discussions. But that doesn't mean we're going to have a, you know, a wonderful relationship. Uh, Putin still uh, causes a lot of mischief around the world and uh, you know, engages in, in, in really abhorrent activities, uh, like, for example, using uh, Novichok chemical weapons in an attempted assassination in Salisbury, England. Um, so you know, we, we need to manage the relationship, be tough where we need to be, and um, 
work very closely with allies. Um, uh, and I think President Biden is, is committed to doing that. Um, and he has a lot of experience in international relations. He was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee for a long time and then vice president for eight years. And, and he has a really um, strong team in place now. Um, let's go to chemical weapons because you, you just mentioned that. And, um, you know, the, the, the part of your career that also is very significant. I mean, there's, it's, it's strewn all the way through there, but I, I think the Syrian situation, and by the way, the Syrian situation for all of those, you don't know our own Richard Falkenrath is also in this book. And we sent out the link in advance, but you're, you're all the way through this, right? And so you're sitting as assistant secretary now and the Syrian civil war is going on and you have all of these terrorist groups walk us through. I mean, you said, by the way, everyone should read chapter one of this book. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. Tell us about that and how can we deter these chemical weapons, especially when they're used as they have been in Syria on their own people? Well, we had um, exquisite intelligence on the Syrian chemical weapons program. Uh, the first chapter is about a, a spy that the CIA had uh, for over, about a decade uh, at a very high level in their secret chemical weapons program. So we knew everything about it until he was uh, caught and executed. But the situation in Syria in 2011, when the, the protests and civil strife started, it became analogous to, um, to the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. All of a sudden, we were perhaps less worried that the Syrian government would launch military attacks against Israel, Jordan, Turkey, uh, and, and very concerned about the loss of control of the Syrian government. There were uh, chemical weapons storage sites around the country, and these areas were being over overrun by Al-Qaeda affiliates like the Al-Nusra Front and, and you know, precursors to, to ISIS. So we were very concerned about about the regime using chemical weapons as they did against their own people when they killed 1,400 um, men, women, and children um, in, in August of, of uh, 2013. Um, but we're, we were mostly concerned about these Al-Qaeda affiliates getting their hands on chemical weapons and launching attacks in Europe or the United States. But on the question of deterrence, there's the famous, even the title of the book, The Red Line, which we didn't, we didn't uphold the red line. Um, and even under the Trump administration, when there was another attack, many criticized the response you know, as not forceful enough. So the question is, do we have an effective deterrence against the use of these types of weapons of mass destruction? And if not, what do we need to do in order to have it? Well, I'm very concerned that, that the norm against the use of these illegal uh, banned uh, chemical weapons, um, biological weapons, is, um, is weakening. Um, I mentioned the, the Salisbury attacks. More recently, uh, chemical weapons were used against a dissident inside Russia. North Korea used uh, VX, a nerve agent. Uh, in an assassination in Malaysia a couple of years ago. And there has not been strong accountability uh, for these uh, you know, war criminals like uh, President Assad of, of Syria. Um, in a way though, the red line worked because the threat of US military force led to Assad giving up 1,300 tons of very, very dangerous chemical weapons. And that's what the book is about, this uh, nearly impossible operation that we managed, the international community, the United States managed to pull off. And Richard Falkenrath was instrumental in making it happen. So you, have, you believe that in terms of uh, states, that there is an effective deterrence on the use of chemical weapons by virtue of that action, because there's still this perception that we didn't act tough enough. Yeah, well, I, 
you know, my own feeling was that once we had removed the chemical weapons stockpile, then we did have more freedom of action for military strikes mm -hmm. to punish the regime. Um, it would not have been practical to bomb the regime when they had 1,300 tons of chemical weapons around the country. Uh, we could have hit non-chemical weapons targets, uh, taken out his air force and his helicopters, for example. But we decided not to do that. Um, I'm less worried about a direct state-to-state uh, -state use than I am about uh, state uh, covert attacks, uh, where one or two operatives deliver chemical weapons or biological weapons. I mean, that is a, uh, is a plausible scenario. Uh, and, and they could even, with some of these biological weapons, do it in a deniable way that they might, would never get caught. So I, I do worry a lot about that. And that was going to be my next question, which is the asymmetric part, the, 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 the people that either internally in those states that get their hands on it, sell it to bad actors or, or what have you. Where do you think we are? Do you think we have effective means against that uh, while it's always a risk? Or do you think we're really, uh, you know, uh, we're not in good shape in terms of protecting against those types of risks? Well, we, we need to do more work. Um, I, I, um, and we need to be on guard and we should continue to uh, make progress in the global elimination of chemical weapons and biological weapons. Uh, I was uh, uh, honored to, to join the uh, ceremony when the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo uh, for uh, the Syrian operation. Um, you know, these weapons are banned. We have treaties uh, banning them and we cannot allow countries to continue to develop stockpile and use them. So we need to uh, make sure that they do pay a price when they, when they uh, engage in, in these terrible illegal acts. Um, I wanna to turn to more the biological weapon front and particularly COVID um, and you wrote in, a, uh, in an article you just recently published, you said, and I quote, as bad as the pandemic is, imagine if instead it were caused by the deliberate release of a sophisticated biological weapon. About 2% of those infected have perished or died from COVID-19, while a disease such as smallpox can kill at a 30% rate. Um, and, and so you essentially go on to talk about how this is a, a threat. What have we learned from this COVID-19 catastrophe about the, you know, or what have the bad actors learned in terms of what they can do to Western societies? I mean, because if you look at it, if, if you look at it, countries like China may have suffered, but they've, they, they've come out of it a lot stronger than at least we appear to us so far. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's my concern is that this, uh... A natural pandemic has has exposed a vulnerability uh, to um, biological weapons, and and as bad as this is a a deliberate uh, state biological weapons attack with a bioengineered weapon uh, enhanced in different ways could be much 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 worse. So we need to be on guard. There are things we can do. Um, going back uh, to Kazakhstan. Um, the world's largest anthrax factory. I think, I think we have a picture of it. Um, I mean, this facility, the Soviet Union had a, a massive uh, illegal biological weapons program. The United States used to have a biological weapons program. And then in 1969, President Nixon decided to eliminate it. So we don't have any biological weapons. But that building, two football fields long in, in, in Kazakhstan, just over the Russian border, was designed to produce and load onto uh, weapons, including missiles aimed at the United States, 300 tons of anthrax agent, which is enough to kill everybody on the planet several times over. Uh, the scale was just unimaginable. But we worked together with the government of Kazakhstan to safely eliminate that facility. But you don't need a big facility, um, especially uh, for some of these trans transmissible human-to-human -human, um, viruses like uh, the respiratory virus, uh, 
uh, that causes COVID-19. So, you know, what do we do? Well, I think the answer is increase our defenses. Um, you know, biodefense uh, has been neglected over the years, but if we invest in in uh, an early warning system, a global early, early warning system for both natural epidemics as well as potential bioterrorist or even state bioweapons attacks, and then we, we could catch it early before it spreads. And then we need a rapid response capability. We need uh, drugs and vaccines that we can, can design and manufacture based on the sequence of the virus or bacteria that's causing the outbreak. Uh, and instead of taking 10 months, like it did this time, which is still extraordinarily fast, let's reduce that to one month or one week so we can have that rapid response. And, and I believe that if we invest in a biodefense system like that, we can actually uh, deter our allies from even developing or continuing biological weapons programs because they'll come to believe that they won't be effective. Right. So um, when you look at the, you know, if, if, if you were sort of in, in the position you were in again, and you look at the situation today between biological, nuclear, uh, chemical, what are the things that are most front of mind? Is it now biological or is it, is it just all of it in, in, in aggregate? Well, it's, it's two issues. I, I would put biological um, weapons as well as pandemics, which I think are a national security issue uh, at the top of my list because it's more accessible to countries than nuclear weapons. Um, and you know, we're experiencing the devastation that it can cause. So um, the North Korean um, nuclear weapons and missile programs get a lot of attention but what's less uh, talked about is the fact that they have a very advanced biological weapons program. And I think they're more likely to use biological weapons against us in a covert attack than they would be to use nuclear weapons, which, which for them to do that would be uh, suicidal. So um, I do worry though very much about the potential for nuclear war. Uh, the um, uh, Putin uh, regime, and then uh, the Trump administration sort of mimicking Putin's policy has been developing smaller, uh, low yield, so-called low yield, which are actually pretty big, uh, nuclear weapons on um, systems that you, are also used for conventional uh, weapons. So it's blurring the line between nuclear weapons and chemical weapons, especially some of these systems like uh, nuclear armed cruise missiles, which you can't detect. Um, they don't have a big uh, footprint like a ballistic missile that you can detect from our early warning system. So I do worry that the risk of nuclear war is increasing. And I think the response to that needs to be to continue with arms control and to increase uh, what we call strategic stability. But the, the, the biological weapons threat uh, is foremost uh, in my list of concerns. So I, I just want to ask a couple more questions, Andy, and then we'll turn, we're going to go to our, to our audience. But um, you, you talked about you know, the threat of nuclear war. So we have a situation right, right in front of us. So I want to turn, return to this issue. And I didn't ask about this particular country, which is, of course, Iran. And of course, we also have North Korea as well. But in Iran, we know that uh, you know, there was an attempt to try and slow that down. And that you know, went somewhat wrong in terms of weapons proliferations across the Middle East that were actually destabilizing. And now we, don't quite, we, we sort of don't know where we are, right? So how, how concerned are you about the evolving situation with the Iranian attempt to secure nuclear weapons? And what should we do about this? What would be the best case scenario from your point of view? And is it realistic? Well, you know, we used to talk about five rogue states, um, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Libya, and Iraq, that were all developing weapons of mass destruction. And one by one, we've really reduced that number. The um, uh, Iranian uh, nuclear agreement that um, the Obama administration negotiated um, prevented Iran from developing nuclear weapons. 
And, you know, Trump said he would get a better deal. Well, he didn't. And now we have no deal. And uh, the Biden administration is going to try to um, reestablish that because we need uh, inspectors on the ground from the International Atomic Energy Agency. We need to monitor uh, Iranian nuclear activities. Um, we have excellent intelligence on the program. Uh, we work very closely with the Israelis on this. And uh, I'm not so worried about Iran developing a nuclear weapon if we can reestablish the controls that we successfully negotiated. But that's going to be difficult. Um, and we've lost ground in both North Korea and, and Iran. The situation vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons is much worse today than it was four years ago. Yeah, and just focusing on North Korea before, uh, you know, we talked about Iran, but North Korea uh, is, you, you know, is they continue to evolve. So is there any effective deterrence there short of, in both cases, war? I mean, in both cases, what, what is the means out of these things short of war? Whether it's from us or from the Israelis in the Iranian case and, and the Gulf nations or, or for us in, you know, in the South Koreans, like what is the path? Well, it's working with allies to deter um, um, aggression, but also keeping uh, uh, channels for diplomacy open so we can, can do the hard work of, of negotiating controls and, and the elimination of some of these uh, uh, nuclear weapons programs. Uh, North Korea is a hard, hard case. We've been working at it for over 20 years, but we need to keep at it because the, the stakes are so, so high. Great. Well, Andy, before I turn it over to Richard to ask the first question, um, I just want to say, you know, you're now in the think tank world and writing articles and, and on advisory boards and, and so on. Is there a return at all to government service uh, in your future? Is, 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 this, is, is it this kind of life that we expect or should we expect more adventures from Andy Weber? Well, I, I, I love the fact that I can stay engaged um, uh, on these issues uh, through my work with the think tank and through my consulting for the U.S. government and DARPA. Um, but, you know, I, I had my time. It's time for, for the new generation to, uh, to, to step up. And, and I, I won't rule out uh, government service, but I think at this point in my career, um, I've earned something like ambassador to Finland or Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm not really eager to go back to the 100 plus hour weeks that uh, that I lived for 30 years. Right. OK, uh, let's now uh, turn to our audience. And I'm going to ask uh, yeah, in honor of their relationship also and, and our respect for Richard. Richard, you get the first question. Go ahead, Richard. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Andy. It's so great to see you and, and whatever retirement, your semi-retirement you're enjoying now, you richly deserve, but I'm pretty confident you'll be back in government service somehow, somewhen. It was, you've got too much knowledge on too important a topic. We covered the range of, um, of, of regional and, and functional issues pretty well, but we left out the U.S. itself. And I'd be interested in your, your thoughts about the U.S. nuclear complex also was something that was in your remit. And the, I think the folks on this call probably lost track that the U.S. itself still has lots and lots of nuclear weapons uh, ready to be launched at a moment's notice. No more chemical weapons and no more bio. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? And what sort of what, what should that right posture be? Are you a kind of global zero person like Bill Perry or where do you come out on our own posture? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to write an op-ed piece uh, that's called The Triad We Need. Um, so I support a tri what we call a triad of nuclear weapons, uh, bombers, uh, intercontinental ballist land-based uh, ballistic missiles, uh, and uh, submarines. Um, but the, the current plan is, uh, is unaffordable. It's excessive. And we don't need redundancy uh, in each leg of the triad. I'll give you an example. Um, under the New START Treaty, we have uh, 60 heavy bombers. When we start um, um, producing the new stealth bomber, the, the B-21 Raider, um, as soon as we have 60 of those, there's no reason to keep the B-2s. There's no reason to keep the B-52s in the nuclear weapons business. But the current plan seems to be 
to have three uh, nuclear armed uh, bombers and the F-35, a tactical a fighter bomber um, capable of carrying nuclear weapons too. And I think, you know, that's excessive. So both for costs and for other priorities, uh, we can have a, a, what I call a smart nuclear weapons modernization program that um, is less redundant. We don't need as many uh, new warheads uh, as in the, in the current plan. Um, so we can also negotiate further reductions uh, with Russia. We're now at 1,550. Uh, our military did a study and they're confident that with 1,000 nuclear weapons um, deployed that we can um, maintain a very, very uh, strong deterrent. Thanks, Andy. Andy, a um, bunch of questions from our uh, from our audience here, but let me start with the first one, which is one risk that we didn't talk about was cyber risk. And is, is this an area where you put uh, a lot of mind share in? And if, and if so, what how do you assess where we are? Um, you're probably not going to be happy with me, my answer. Um, obviously, uh, cyber weapons are, are a, a big risk, but we're dealing with it day to day. We have this uh, public-private cooperation, pretty good network, a whole cybersecurity industry. Um, we're investing in it. I don't think uh, cyber uh, is going to cause the end of the world. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's a problem. We also have very good cyber offensive capabilities that we don't talk about, um, you know, really second to none. So I, there is a concern that that these less than nuclear weapons could lead to a nuclear exchange. So a cyber attack, um, infiltration, penetration of our nuclear command and control system could cause some confusion and that could escalate to a nuclear conflict. Uh, so I do worry about that specific uh, scenario. Okay. There's a, here's a question. Um, you, you mentioned a, you know, a biodefense program. How would you reconcile this with the U S uh, population having a relatively high level of vaccine mistrust? And how would you ensure such defenses are applied in an efficient, fast and widespread way? Yeah, well, obviously vaccine hesitancy is a problem, but on the other hand, uh, I'm getting my shot tomorrow. I'm very excited about that. Um, it's been extraordinary. And, and let me just say, people don't understand. The reason we have this uh, mRNA vaccine technology, it's not because of NIH. It's because of DARPA at the Department of Defense. Uh, when nobody else was interested, they invested in really a high-risk uh, program uh, to have a rapid vaccine response capability and now it's being deployed in humans for, for the first time uh, with, with a, you know, just miraculous um, effectiveness. So I'm, I think it's a new age for vaccines. We obviously need to um, improve the efficiency of manufacturing, delivery. Um, new technologies are in the works, for example, a microneedle uh, patch, so you wouldn't have to have uh, injections. That's one possibility or inhaled vaccines that make it easier. Perhaps even we could mail them to everybody's home um, in an emergency. But um, we are making progress. Technologies for biodefense and for protecting against pandemics, and let's make this the last pandemic because I think we can, have been really accelerated in the last year. Uh, it's, it's exciting to see the revolution in diagnostics, smartphone-based, in-home diagnostics, genetic sequencing. Uh, it's getting cheaper and faster. Uh, synthetic biology companies like Ginkgo Bioworks and Twist are contributing their capabilities to our COVID response. So we can have, indeed, the, the Council on Strategic Risks has a program that we call Making Bioweapons Obsolete. And we're calling on the government and public-private partnerships to invest in this system of early warning and rapid response that we think can deter uh, biological weapons. Um, I want to. Uh, this is an interesting question about uh, the capability of intelligence, you know, and how that's evolved. Uh, you know, because back in in the early two thousands, 
there, there was a notion that intelligence believed with, with significant probability that the Iraqis had weapons of mass destruction. And then that proved to be false, um, or at least on the nuclear front, right? Um, the question is, with the advent of a technology and just the evolution of technique, do we have high confidence in the intelligence community that we actually would not make a similar mistake as we're assessing the capabilities, at least of the state, um, that we made back at that time 20 years ago? Well, in intelligence against uh, you know, hard targets, denied area targets, it it's very difficult. Um, so we never, we never get all the facts or have a perfect uh, picture. But um, I would say that this really is the golden age of intelligence, uh, especially uh, signals intelligence, um, because everything's digital. Um, it's, it's retrievable. And, and uh, you know, in the privileged position I served in, uh, in the Obama administration, um, I was a customer for our best intelligence and it was extraordinary. Um, so it's very, very important that we continue to invest in all types of intelligence collection and analysis. I think the uh, Iraq situation was, um, you know, it, it was unfortunate. They did have weapons of mass destruction programs and we got rid of them in the 1990s with the first Gulf War and then the UN inspections after that. Um, but it's, it's hard to prove a negative. And, and given you know, Saddam uh, signaling to his neighbors that he still had them because he, he wanted his neighbors to, to think that he had them, uh, it, was a, it was a difficult situation. I'm not sure it would have changed the fact uh, of us going to war against Iraq uh, for the second time uh, because that was the agenda no matter what the intelligence was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question, and, and I think this is an interesting one. Do you think that we're on the verge of seeing the last manned military war? In other words, if we were to have a war that we're sort of getting with drones and robots and so on, will it actually involve people on the front lines? Well, I don't. I don't think we're going to have sort of the traditional, you know, conventional um, war. Um, but the soldiers, the individuals, are still going to be the most important aspect, and that's why you know we have the best military in the world, and it's mostly because of the quality of of our of our soldiers, uh, airmen, and sailors, Marines, um, the educational level, the uh, ingenuity. It's just extraordinary. I, I had the chance during my career to work with some of our more elite units and you would just be amazed. I'm sure some of them are probably working for uh, Bridgewater now, but these are the smartest, uh, most highly skilled people you can imagine. So absolutely, they will be augmented with these um, autonomous uh, vehicles and, and different technologies, but um, we're gonna continue to rely on on our, our uh, military personnel. This is an interesting question uh, coming coming in from one of our one of our people, which is that you know you you tag Russia as an adversary, and even going back to the early 1990s in the you know in the whole episodes of Project Sapphire, Russia was a weak state. That's what you're talking. About. You also talked about Syria that way. China is an economically strong state. And it is our biggest rival at this at this point. And so you have all these threats around us. But how how do you think about the uh, emerging emergence of China from their point of economic strength with their capabilities? How do we manage that? Just as someone that's been so involved in the national security arena. Well, we manage it um, as as a competition. We we cooperate where we have to on issues like climate change. Uh, even uh, even on pandemics, uh, in spite of the fact that this pandemic originated in China, uh, we need to work together um, because no country is safe uh, against these global threats. But you know there are things that we're going to disagree on, and that's not new. Um, what is new is is uh, facing uh, uh, a potential adversary with so much economic uh, might. 
But I think we need to de-emphasize the military aspects of that. We don't want to go to war with China. They, they don't want to go to war with the United States. We both have nuclear weapons. That would be a, a terrible, terrible day were that to happen. Um, so we just need to use all the tools of, of diplomacy and deterrence and prevention and manage the situation. But it's not going to be easy. It takes really highly skilled uh, capabilities. Another question here is you, you talked a lot about cooperation with allies in fighting bio or chemical or nuclear uh, uh, terror. Do you think that the U.S. will continue to invest its relationship with traditional partners in Western Europe and in Japan, for example? And do you think that's happening here in the COVID situation? And if not, do you think there's a risk these countries take more individualistic approach to their security? We, we have to re, re-strengthen our alliances and, and our bedrock alliances, NATO, Japan, Republic of Korea. Um, you know, th- those have been uh, uh, troubled relationships in some aspects over the last four years. So we need to rebuild that. Uh, the United States is strongest when we work with partners, non-traditional partners, as well as our traditional allies. Um, so that has to be our, our highest priority is, is strengthening those relationships. But we're no longer going to be able to call all the shots. I mean, these are true partnerships. And I don't think we need to worry about um, these countries uh, going on their own. Uh, They're not going to necessarily do everything we ask them to do, but uh, we're not going to do everything they ask us to do either. That's normal, um, you know, relations between states. Um, A question here in in sort of the minutes we have left here. uh, The U.S. is probably facing more internal political polarization than any time in our lifetimes. uh, And that's probably true for the entire audience here. How does that affect our ability to manage these strategic threats, if at all? It hurts us. It hurts us a lot. Our standing in the world has fallen. And um, you know, uh, until we can sort of get our own house in order, it makes it pretty hard for us to, for example, to complain when Putin rigs an election or uh, you know, our moral authority has been somewhat uh, damaged. So we need to really focus on uh, you know, rebuilding that um, consensus, that middle ground uh, in our country in order to have a stronger position in the world. The two are directly related. And are you, conf- I mean, are, are you, you know, obvi- we're all make these assessments, but as you look at this situation and you've looked at other countries that have sort of come apart, are you confident in our institutions and our people and this is a phase or are you more worried than that? Well, I'm highly confident in the strength of our institutions. I think we've just experienced that. And um, right now the, the, the focus needs to be to isolate this very, very small number of uh, domestic extre- extremists, penetrate them and neutralize them. Um, and we can do that. But the... Uh, the polarized politics are, are disturbing. Um, um, so we need, to, we need to work on it. And, and uh, it's very, very important to our national security. Uh, again, the, the images at the Capitol, uh, I have friends uh, all over the world and they, they just were asking and shaking their heads, what's going on in the United States? So we need to do better. But um, well, you know, one thing I've learned throughout my career is the genius of our system is the ability to, to course correct, to, to self-improve. You know, I grew up uh, with all the scandals when Nixon was president. We got past that and came out stronger. So I'm, I'm confident that we'll come out stronger uh, in future years. And then we'll maybe close on this one. There's been an idea that's come, come about, and I'm just wondering what you think about it especially because of your long government service. And we also hear this from uh, inside Bridgewater when we talk to our people that have, have, mili- you know, have, have military backgrounds and so on. What do you think of um, the idea of compulsory service, whether it be a year or two years and whether it be in the military or whether it be in schools or whether it be in some other function of, of society to try and bring people with different backgrounds together do you think that would be a good idea? And do you think it's at all plausible? 
Oh, I think it would be fantastic. I fully support uh, some type of, of national service, uh, civilian service. Uh, for example, with COVID, we could have created a COVID core, uh, especially when people with, with colleges closed. We could have had young people working, uh, delivering vaccine today. We could have that, uh, doing the testing. But we didn't really have strong federal leadership. But I think it's important to have uh, some way to have national service to, to unify us as, as, as a people. Uh, I worked with a lot of countries that had compulsory military service, uh, countries like Israel. And, and it strengthens the whole country by having that common experience. Great. Well, we'll leave it there. We're at the hour. And uh, I just want to thank you from all of the Bridgewater community. It's just been uh, a, a great hour to speak with a true American hero. And I say that uh, not lightly. I think it's um, really you, quite a career. And thank you so much for everything you've done for, for our country. And uh, we wish you the best of luck as you tackle your further challenges as you go forward. Well, thank you, Jim and, and Richard and everyone on the Bridgewater team. I've really enjoyed uh, spending uh, part of the afternoon with you. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone, for participating.